Hello, everyone. Would you like to impact a billion lives? Welcome to our show, IIT 2020, Impact Fireside Video Series, where we invite thought leaders, innovators to discuss their approach of, to the future, especially in post-pandemic world. Today, I have invited a very special guest and dear friend of mine, Ramin. Ramin is founder of Human Capital Network, a London-based venture capital and private equity group. He has an extensive board experience serving in public and private companies globally. He has worked with companies uh, of phenomenal size, 20, 30 billion dollar, and reported to the chairmen and really transformed major, major organizations in his past. And now he is here to help us transform our future. Dr. Ramin has, he holds PhD from University of Americas, London in finance. And now he is, a, he consider himself digital disruptor. So let's talk to him and ask him about his vision of human capital network. So Dr. Ramin, I looked through your website and I love the vision you have. Really, really phenomenal vision. And one line really resonated with me. That's the reason I reached out to you is tangible impact comes from true collaboration. Focusing on changing behaviors while giving a space to diversity, leveraging heterogeneous team, talents, and experience that combine old traditional wisdom with new methodologies in a cross industry approach. It's a pretty, pretty big and bold statement as we both know. Can you talk a little bit more about it so our audience can understand what is the thought behind it and what would you like to accomplish? Sure. Sanjay, first of all, thanks for your time. Uh, thanks for asking me to be here and thanks to all of those of you who are interested uh, in, in listening to the story. Um, look, it's a very long sentence. I'm not so sure if it's that bold. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, we 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 all get caught up um, in so many different mythologies. Ultimately, I think life can be pretty simple. And as part of that, if you distill what you just said uh, into very simple building blocks, um, diverse teams, people with experiences from so many different walks of lives, um, different genders, um, different age groups, a, a wealth of experience that if you put them together, all of those experiences will infuse something um, that comes out, which is uh, going to be more rounded um, as if you only have the same people who are thinking about the world in the very same way. Number two, probably to the statement, um, I have been a believer for a very long time that um, you know, some of the biggest problems in the world cannot be solved by one individual. I think that you need different type of people collaborating with one another in order to really have an impact. And as the problems of the world are getting bigger, I think collaboration is therefore so much more important um, because um, you cannot do it on your own. And uh, uh, therefore, you know, it is one, one of the biggest lessons learned, I think that particularly in this time and age, it is less thinking about competing with one another, but finding ways as to collaborating and um, everyone along the way um, benefiting from it. And benefiting can be for some of material financial nature for others it can be achieving an output oriented initiative that they have in mind and therefore i think you know if you put all of this together it just uh, it adds the talent uh, that is required in order to to make those changes and so with that in mind human capital network is you know at the intersection point i think in between what I would call the next level of transformation that we're seeing and that uh, we need to drive forward 
which is the transformation of pivoting to purpose. I think if you appreciate that, the actually the that brings to my question actually. So we can talk about that uh, with the specific question I have around that. And uh, so there is one term I'm talking uh, and really discussing with a lot of speakers with me, innovation or purpose-driven innovation, basically. So we talk about impact enterprises, we talk about innovation uh, in the nonprofit world, we talk about a lot of things, but when we talk about really at a global scale, none of these things is time. And uh, when we talk of innovation, we talk about disruption, we don't talk about how we create a purpose-driven innovation. So what is your take on that? And especially in a larger organization settings or larger problem setting. Look, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite susceptible to terminology. So I don't like the word disruption. I think uh, nobody really likes it. Um, and I think even those that are innovators that are challenging um, a legacy business, that it's not about disrupting, it is about invoking change and, and creating new, and maybe acting as a catalyst as part of that to show that it can, or things can be done in a different way. Number two, um, you know, along that, you, um, you mentioned the words impact, um, uh, and in the same breath, uh, NGO. Um, I do believe that you can drive uh, impact, that you can be purposeful and purpose and profit. They are not mutually exclusive. In fact, I think going forward uh, right now, purpose is a prerequisite for profit. And if you don't have an ESG strategy and if you're not purpose oriented, if you're not becoming a sustainable value creation organization, then those that are your audience, they will not buy from you as a result of that it has a negative effect. Because you are not a purpose driven organization or uh, you don't stand for uh, uh, really uh, the values of our audience or our customers have. I think, I think, um, Yes, I think it is about the values. I think we're going to go through, uh, you know, a number of different stages. Uh, uh, the first stage is about realization and awareness. And I think uh, over the last uh, eight, nine months with the uh, COVID pandemic, we uh, are at a point where the awareness is uh, uh, sharpened. Yeah. And you Absolutely. hear things where people are talking about, you know, the new normal. Uh, again, a term that I don't feel comfortable with because I think if the new normal is a reflection on the normal that we just came from, we might want to not think about it as um, a compromise of what we have, but actually as an opportunity to make drastic seismic changes, which are required. So I think as you know, we're going through this, uh, this um, period and, and awareness, therefore, after the awareness, the expectation comes by which organizations have to have an answer to sustainability. Mm -hmm. And the importance is as the awareness heightens and people are more educated, you can't greenwash a sustainable strategy. True. And it has to be profound and it has to be transparent and it has to be measurable. So, you know, when I, when I use the words about impact, it is about measurable outcome that through the actions that you drive, you can verify uh, that you're making a difference. That, that so I think is. So basically it's for this overall societal benefit, but at the same time, you are creating tremendous value, not just a social impact. So uh, let's, let's change the question a little bit. Uh, you and me, actually, uh, we started our career around the same time. And uh, we both lived uh, the time when internet was just started. And uh, we had a search engine, and before that we had HTML pages, and then we have all the basic stuff. And uh, I heard a lot of the stories about my friends hanging out with Larry Allison and all. And today, like almost 25 years later, we have this 
uh, big organizations like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, and they have created this very interesting and very cool foundational layer for developers. So now a kid in a garage with high school education and YouTube, he can create and solve the future problems. So what my question is, you and me have worked with very, very large organizations and uh, uh, indirectly or directly. I am seeing, uh, I mean, I think about it and I say I go 50, 60 years ago, a uh, person like Pacific Gas and Electric, utility companies used to be pretty big deal and they were like on the cutting edge. So do you see that kind of shift happening even in this internet world or uh, cloud world where uh, people, uh, anybody with an idea can create newer opportunity or solve a newer problem? And that will create more impact kind of organizations than uh, expecting uh, larger organizations to pivot or change. Um, before I answer this uh, one comment, I don't think you need, you need maybe the garage on a computer, but I don't think you need a university degree to make a difference. Exactly. So, um, look, I think anyone, uh, can make that difference. Um, and, uh, uh, obviously that with today's technology, um, uh, it enables you to, uh, automate uh, uh, to to program and to create um, uh, uh, you know elements that can um, can be of benefit that ultimately you can sell and you can offer to the public and all of a sudden you know you've got a business going for yourself. Um, so yes, I think anybody can do that. But I think the you know, one shouldn't think only about it. It's very important to me that innovation is only in association with uh, technology and that it has to be a developer that uh, is an innovator. The way I look ultimately in, um, into innovation uh, and particularly with that change, first and foremost, it's about, you know, it's business model innovation and you may- require technology as a tool to enable it but it is not because of the technology and then and then you look and there's many examples in that Sanjay uh, you brought the point up and I'm not embarrassed to say because I learned from it but in the mid 90s um, I had a group of engineers from a very renowned uh, institute in my office I used to be at the music industry and I was not the only one. So it makes it easier to share this, this little anecdote. Um, and they had something which was, you know, technological ultimately it was compression technology. And I was wondering why they were approaching me. You know, I was rock and roll and selling music and it was all about the artist. Led Zeppelin. And it was ignorance to some extent and complacency that we didn't understand what you know, what was then called MP3 would not only change the music industry, but it would give birth to so many new businesses. It was the demise of many other companies and it was an injection of birth to what then Apple became uh, uh, in a way as a consumer product again of what it is today. Yeah. So it is not necessarily what you look at it for what it is, but it is that change and, and the impact of the business innovation as a model that offers so many new opportunities. So well, I completely agree with you on that. And uh, similarly on that MP3 note, uh, so I know the co-founder of the company. Uh, so if you don't know, Apple licensed the core software from another company based out of Silicon Valley. It was not even their software, but Steve Jobs came up with the idea and the, the vision around business, exactly what you're talking about, the, what is a business vision and what it can do. These guys were created an amazing technology. You can put it on a hard drive and you can do the songs, but Steve Jobs is the one he really saw the tremendous value. So I completely agree with you. It's all about the business vision. Uh, technology should lead and help us execute those business vision. But a question I have for you, since you are into investing. Yes, sorry. Just for one second. So um, it's not only about creating the iPod. It is as the iPod is flying through the roof of actually disrupting yourself and launching the iPhone, 
to then pivot into a new model at its height. And at the very same time, some of those companies that would have never in a million years believed that they you know, didn't even look in the rear mirror as to whether they had challenges as telco uh, mobile operating companies, they had all the very same drawing more or less lying in the drawers, but they didn't take them out because they thought they could milk the cow for a little longer. And it was, we create the demand as opposed to, you know, so I think we're now going to be in a world, to use that analogy, whereby it is no longer an economy that is focusing and that is supply oriented, but it is a new economy which should be demand led. And, and that is going to be a big difference. And that is, you know, one of the principles of being in that, uh, in the sustainable economy, which is demand led and not supply so I have a question um, on that, uh, Dr. Raymond, around demand led. You know, we are grown up and uh, basically I was taught every single time, in a, especially I'm with a larger organization. So the customer doesn't know what they want. You have to show them. So the classic Ford uh, uh, example is if I would have asked people, they would have said faster horses. So how an organization like yours and entrepreneurs you are working with, you're working with a very large group of people. How they really see these demands or the, uh, I should say, these indicators or how you see the indicators of the future? I think um, that's a good question. And I think the, there are shades or different perspectives when you go through it. I think you know, we're at an age where we, we maybe we want to distinguish a little bit between incremental innovation and moonshots. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe the moonshots is what we would today think about the unimaginable, which maybe you need to show to people to desire or to understand that that can be done. Whereas I think on incremental innovation, we're in a different domain. And on incremental innovation, which is still, you know, very innovative and it's moving uh, our world forward. Now there is an expectation because the knowledge is there. People are beginning to understand more. There are more advocates uh, in online, in media that are ultimately informing the public that what they have been sold mm -hmm. versus the reality is no longer acceptable. And that in, in, in respect of sustainability, it is not what you just read in the press of, you know, the percentage in terms, because if a company only goes out and buys, you know, uh, sustainable bonds or credits that doesn't make what they produce necessarily sustainable. So over a period of time, what we eat, what we consume, all of those elements, people are becoming more aware, they're becoming smarter, they are, they're interested. And I think as a result of that in incremental innovation steps, um, that is something which is demand driven. And the more the expectation grows, the more um, there is a social corporate responsibility to offer those kind of elements up to its customers and consumers. That makes sense. So. Uh... I mean, today, you and me both know every single human being can be a brand or they are a brand. And we have served and worked with a lot of big brands. So how do you really see the future of these brands uh, in today's world? And especially I'm talking about uh, when we talk about innovation at Moonshot or we talk about incremental innovation, you and me both know uh, saying moonshot is very interesting, but it always, there is an incremental step. You take a bigger problem, but you start solving it in increments. And you hope, uh, like good example is, uh, Elon Musk decided to put the man on the Mars. Now, initially it was just an idea. And everybody asks me nowadays, oh, why is he doing it? Is he going to be colonizing a Mars? And I am looking at this very differently. And I'm sure you can relate to that. Because we put the man on the moon in 69, we have changed the world. The amount of innovation happened in that period, a lot of those things really started what 
we were able to reap at a later date from the technology. What we are going to work around the Mars and build it, the technology is going to be so phenomenal, we both know. So the question I am really asking is a pretty broader question is, what do you really see as a future of humans? Or you really see where are we going? And where are the true opportunities for our uh, entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs? Because most of our audience are, uh, I will say almost 40 to 50%. Either they have a startup or they want to start a company and they will be knocking your door very soon. You're welcome. <laughs> so let me let me ask you this question. I don't want to I don't want to answer your question with a counter question. But it is not the technology that allowed us to fly to the moon, which is smaller and less sophisticated than what is buried in my iPhone today. It is what it has in created in our heads that no boundaries are there. If the will is there and the ambition is there, you can do it. And I think this is when you think about why is a moonshot called a moonshot? That is what it is. It is, there is no boundary. It is, it's obscure. It's, it's unbelievable, but it can be done. Now you ask me, frankly, do I want to fly to the moon? Not particularly, no. Um, and um, do I think that now we've been to the moon, I necessarily have an ambition to go to Mars? With all the problems that we have right near, right now, um, it's, you know, I have a view. But if this is what it takes to enable people to, to have the willingness and to have the mindset of saying, everything can be done, then if that triggers a movement and an aspiration in individuals to focus on what we need to do right here, each and every one of us in our everyday life, then that is a good thing. What does this mean with regards to entrepreneurs and what is the world going to be like tomorrow? Well, look, Sanjay, I'm sure you've watched a number of, of the most recent, quite daunting, quite incredible movies. One in particular, for people like you and I who have been part in building some of the backbone technologies and marketing technologies and God knows what. If you watch um, The Social Dilemma, even, even I, even you, and we're doing this and we have been doing this and we have been part creators of this. I go, oh my God, you know, it just zooms back and you go, no, this cannot be the answer. And I think the point is technology is an incredible thing. But I think we are now at a point where we shouldn't be using it in order to satisfy and create fictitious desires of people needing to own something that they quite frankly don't. But rather to use it and have it as a backbone in order to do good. And this is not, I'm not talking about this as a Samarita, but I mean it really, we have been living in, in, uh, in overindulging and producing for the possibility of because we can and it's wrong. And I think the more we realize that, you know, our own behaviors have created that. So what is what is the way to go? Well, number one, the way not to go is to just carry on for greed without thinking about the impact it has. That's not and, the future it's generations. Good it is good to know sometimes what not to do when you're trying to figure out what to do. What is good to do is to help organizations to identify of how how to retain relevance in the future. And this is where I would personally appeal to all the entrepreneurs is going back to the, on the outset, you asked me about disruption. I think you can be a phenomenal entrepreneur also by collaborating with the legacy infrastructure companies and industry by helping the industry to make that shift and that seismic, you know, pivot um, 
to, 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 uh, to the future. And so personally speaking, I don't, I don't look out to find the unicorn. I look out to find incredibly ambitious, smart entrepreneurs who I can help to support, um, provided that whatever it is that they do, that their business model innovation through technology or else has a positive impact in ultimately creating a more desirable future for the generations to come. Completely agree. I can't uh, agree with you more. In fact, uh, I'm seeing it as we talk about sustainability, we talk about uh, uh, earth friendly, but uh, we are producing more and more waste. Uh, I live in a country uh, where we produce almost 60 times of waste than anywhere else on planet. And uh, it's just strange uh, the amount of con things we consume, we don't need to. And uh, it's not just, uh, it's, it's creating, I'm leaving the problem for my kids and the next generations. And uh, people like you and me are, uh, actually we have to take action because we are in a place where we can. So society expect us and it is our uh, responsibility. So I'm so glad uh, you started uh, uh, this new organization and we are really, you are pushing and especially you are collaborating with the different parties because uh, we both know the answer is human capital network is not about one human or not one entrepreneur. You have to bring institutions, you have to bring government, you have to bring policymakers, you have to bring a large organization all at one platform so we can really at least have a conversation and start thinking about what is really the question. Because our biggest challenge today is we don't uh, really agree on what is the question? What is the problem you are, we are trying to solve? Exactly what you said. We can put a man on the moon, but we have to decide. We want to put the man on the moon first. Then we figure out how to build the rocket. But what we do it is we build the rocket and we say, oh, hopefully somebody will buy it. And that's where the biggest challenge is. So uh, I have another question for you. Uh, this is regarding, uh, and it's a little controversial. We have the pandemic issue right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, what really bothered me is uh, we, even today, I get up to March or April that we were trying to figure it out what is going on because it caught us off guard. Even today, I don't see a holistic uh, framework being built by all the nation. We have 197 countries recognized by UN where we start talking about a trust network. We start talking about data share which is relevant. We start talking about building systems like tsunami. So question I'm asking is, it is my long dream that for innovation to happen, we need to build large global scale innovation. It can't be localized innovation in Silicon Valley or London or in Seattle or in India. It has to be more larger scale, whether we want to produce new kind of drugs or we wanted to build a, a new kind of material. And we saw what is happening today when it talk, talks about when we talk about producing drugs or or a vaccine, the whole world is united. But I'm not seeing an initiative where there is a platform for data share. Do you see an opportunity of that? And if there is, what are the challenges? Sorry, a lot of questions. That's a loaded question. I'm trying to I'm trying to answer this as politically correct as I can, and I'm not good in that. Um, look, give us your honest answer. No, no, I will give you my honest answer, but that still means I can can try to be um, uh, watching my language. Um, so, I think look the the. Um, your your observation is unfortunately right, and I share that observation. And um, um, you know, when I think about it, I wonder whether it is uh, an ingrained cultural um, human instinct that is me first, everybody else after. And then, if you were to uh, translate that into countries, it is you know one country over another. 
the reality is, it, yes, it is a big problem. And I think when you look at Europe, for example, uh, and you take uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, some countries had it first and offered up advice and other countries uh, were completely blasé about it and said, you know, what's happening over there isn't going to come here. Yeah. And it is the global world by which a pandemic spreads as it does because the world has gotten so small and it takes a few people to go from one to go somewhere else. Number one. Number two, um, you know, the problem then in Europe, um, and you can then expand on that, is if you have local governments and not one government, um, then ultimately most of the bigger decisions are made on a government country by country level. And that might then lead to the question to ask, is there when it really matters, is there a unified, is there such thing as a Europe other than, you know, a, the freedom to drive around borders uh, without showing a passport and, and uh, 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 one, one currency. Because it is a lot more than that what matters um, as we have just seen. Where, where then becomes an even greater problem is that in small or in big the level or the lack of guidance of the governments of taking actions and having to balance uh, you know e economics over safety of people and you get to the point where I think as individuals you become quite concerned and the lack of trust in, to answer your question, data sharing. When people don't believe that the app in which you are supposed to get best advice, whether you might be at risk or not, but you can't be sure how your data is being used, there's a level of distrust. And I think that trust needs to be uh, rebuilt. Uh, that isn't going to happen overnight. The problem is we have the pandemic now. And I think even now, as I'm talking to you, I am so concerned about the lack of, um, of uh, realization uh, of how serious that is. And, you know, there's more and more people being infected. And as um, one may have thought we got it under control, everybody is traveling around and people are very relaxed in certain parts and wearing masks. I mean, I still hear about people who don't believe it exists, which is insulting to those who have either had it or had people um, that got critically ill with it. So, yeah, I find it frightening and it's something that needs to be dealt with. But I think those are the kind of problems that we face when we look at building large data so let's go a little deeper into that uh, uh, my take is very simple i'm an entrepreneur and uh, i grew up where i don't wait for people to build it for me what fascinates me is when i came to this country america america was built the whole country is built by entrepreneurs entrepreneur even build the foundational layer of the country. And I can say that with full conviction because it is recorded. They build the railroad. They set up the communication system. In America, everything was laid out by the entrepreneurs. But that has changed in the last 50 years. If we really see the role of the government, and I believe it is, it's, there is a fine balance. What is the role of the government and what is the role of uh, private enterprise and what needs to be done to protect the interest of citizens? The challenge I see it is we have to rethink a whole governing structure because we are governing countries and the world with the systems we developed 200, 300 years ago. If you really see it, there is no change really happened in the last 30, 40 years. The world has changed in 50 years. You and me are living a very different kind of life. We have a very different intellect. Internet has proven that world is flat. We all know that. Internet has created this foundational layer that everybody is connected. COVID has uh, shown us, really shown us, it was a wake up call. Whether you close your borders or don't close your border, I'm here. We are all connected. 
So the challenge I'm seeing it is, and I'm not uh, the politician or I'm not the guy, but I look at everything as how an entrepreneur can help. And I personally believe if all the entrepreneurs globally join hands and create this system where government interference is only making some level of policies, because today with the uh, different kind of technologies, you know, we can do phenomenal work. Blockchain has proved that there are tremendous opportunities around that if you use it right way. We can create phenomenal infrastructure as an entrepreneur, which can be the almost like the seed for the next level of this conversation because government won't be able to even comprehend what technology can do today. They are running the country with the different system, different processes. That process needs to change. But question I have for you is, if somebody comes to you and say, hey, he can present a solution where we have or we can create a trust network and the data can come in, can reside, and the government can apply their own policies to that, which is no different than typical network traffic, if you talk about it or think about it. It's exactly the same internet we are talking, just the data is different. You have security there, you have the process there, you have a complete network, one line to other end, you decide who sees what, everything is taken care of. It's not like it's not there. The only difference is information is different now. So question for you is where I believe people like you who can make the difference is think about these areas and maybe give some opportunities to some entrepreneurs who can make the difference in creating this fabric rather than waiting for government to solve it for us. We have to take the ownership. We can't leave it to government. I think, I mean, I don't believe in that. I think, um... I think the, this is the question. Sorry, I'm right? putting on your spot. No, 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 you're not. I was wondering whether, whether, uh, whether there was a question mark ending yes. with it or it was just a statement. Sanjay. Just a statement. I, look, I, I, I think that I, I have a slightly different view um, uh, because I think it is not one or the other. I think the governments have, and they're important, they have a role and uh, they need to govern. Um, but you can, governing should not prohibit innovation, um, if that makes sense. So I think the way that I look at it is if you would take uh, the explosion of artificial intelligence, I think would maybe be uh, to bring it alive with, with what I'm thinking. I think in the absence of clarity of the rules and regulations, you cannot stop innovation from advancing. And this is, this is a serious issue because you can't put blocks um, around and create uh, 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 legislations that make it difficult because if the technology is there, it will just happen. The question is, are you there for short change in your own uh, citizens in your country from participating in a new digital revolution that they could be part of and build new businesses and so on. The second part is if you don't, the end consumer sooner or later will have to make a choice whether buying a product which is as good, maybe even better at lesser price because built with technology versus the one that that is not, uh, but at least you could say, but it comes from here. And I think you and I both know the answer, which means that sooner or later, again, as a result of being ill-equipped to give the, the uh, guardrails in which something operates, you prohibit and uh, you disadvantage. Having said that, I think, so entrepreneurs, and I think there is, is not just entrepreneurs, I think any responsible leader, uh, business people, they have a responsibility to advise governments and uh, to support entrepreneurs and innovators in discovering and building the new. But equally that does not mean that it is free for all and we should protect those that don't know not everybody's got their heart in the right place, Sanjeev. And some Can of that just please? could end up in a very bad place. True, true. So, uh, Raymond, uh, 
the point I was trying to make it is I'm not challenging uh, the current government structure. I'm not challenging any of those because it has a purpose and it is serving that purpose and we need it. Actually, we need it for our own good. We both know that. Point I was trying to make it and point I'm trying to make it actually, it's not was, is people like us have a fiduciary responsibility to the next generation. And I'm taking that as a responsibility because I don't want to say, hey, it's not my job. And, oh, I see. Right. And as an entrepreneur, I believe there are things people like you and me can start. We can help the world build that foundation. Uh, what I'm trying to say it is UN is doing a great job. But when you talk about UN, UN started before the tech. Now the technology has completely changed. So we need a different kind of structure. But you are on the World Economic Forum. Having a conversation, bringing amazing people on one platform is wonderful. How about we put a structure together? We bring the best of the best mind, the expert of AI, and really we talk about the uh, ethics in AI. Let's really work on that. What are we waiting for? Nobody's going to invite us. And uh, as a human, we have solved a lot of problems in past. Let's solve this problem together. And government won't be able to do it because it is very different structure. They are not designed to solve these kind of problems yet. Future, yes. Uh -huh. Look, I <laughs> don't open another door, Sanjay. Oh. You did so well until now. So, so here's what I would I would say. I would say I think there's a there's a time for talking and discussing and creating awareness, and then there's a time for action. And I do see a lot of talk, and it's good talk, but in in a large group finding consensus to then make it right for everyone and move things forward is not always easy so i can only speak for myself and i can only uh, give you a reflection of uh, uh, the members of the human capital network we are very happy to carry on the discussion alongside and updating and informing and creating awareness and finding that consensus to bring others on board. But we have equally decided that we are looking now to create this impact. And ultimately, and I think this is really important, uh, Sanjay, we at Human Capital Network, um, we define ourselves not by Human Capital Network and a brand. It is it is about the impact that we create through the actions that we're able to drive with our partners because it's our partners who need to do that. We can bring them the tools, methodologies, frameworks, but it's them who need to do it. And, and I said it today to someone, I always look for analogies because sometimes I'm incredibly long-winded, but it's a little bit, you know, like a doctor. A doctor can give you a diagnosis. He knows what is wrong and you can go and get another three or four opinions. It takes even longer and you're not necessarily getting better whilst you're doing it. And then the doctor will give you the medicine. But now it is down to you to follow that advice, take the medicine to get better. And if you don't do it, it can't be the doctor's mistake for not having told you so. So if you take this in an analogy in terms of business, it's very much the same. And I think what we see, unfortunately, a lot of the leaders of large organizations are not yet bold enough. And I'm sure there are reasons for it, but it is about not continuously looking for benchmarking of what are my other peer groups doing. You need to have and identify your own. Otherwise, everybody is moving incrementally in a similar sort of direction. So that is the difference and that is what we are trying to help. And so if we manage and you said, you know, do we want to change a billion lives? My God, I would be happy to participate in changing one life. Um, it's, it's everything that you do. It's what we get, gets me going up in the morning. And, and if we can change a billion lives, it's not going to be us it'll be people like us it'll be networks like the human capital network that is doing it through organizations and having those trusted relationships and making that difference but but you need to create lighthouses and if you don't start 
then it is a lot of talk because people want to prove points. And I think if you, and that is what we decided, if we can work behind the scenes with organizations, they need to be the heroes and they need to step up and then take it to the next level. And that is ultimately what we do. I completely agree with you, Ramin, on that. And uh, I have been given this position by the power uh, from a lot of people. I represent today half a million alumni globally in 100 plus countries. And I'm taking my job very seriously. And the reason I'm talking about these foundational issues, because if I don't, then nobody else will. So I have a responsibility. Second is, I really believe we can continue to point fingers on someone else if we don't step up and we don't start taking actions. It's not going to be solved. We have a huge cloud. These half a million alums have generated trillions of dollars worth of capital and income for a lot of organizations. We have, I recorded, uh, I have a track. We have more than thousand multi-billion dollar companies created, founded, and ran by IIT alumni. More than thousand, not one or two we are talking here. So, so point is, we all have to rise to this occasion. This pandemic should be our wake up call. We should all act together, work with our government, work with our education institution, work with every single citizen and create this foundation. And that is really what IID 2020 is about. It's not a two days event. What we really want to do it is no talk because we are all entrepreneurs. We want to solve it. Now, I completely agree with you. I won't be able to change billion life by myself, but if half a million of us combine hands, we can change the whole world not just 1 billion people. And that is really my desire that the dialogue I'm having with you and bringing people like you and have this platform exactly like human network you are talking, how we create that foundation and the people who wants to make the difference or people who wants to be that one life at a time, absolutely okay. But with that, we can change the whole world. I'm sorry, uh, but the point I'm trying to make it is we cannot say it is a government responsibility. That's all point I'm trying to make. It is my responsibility, it's every single citizen's responsibility. We have to take action and we have to be part of it. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are problems, just like a startup. We have so many startups fail. So okay. yeah, I'm sure a lot of us will fail. Our initiative will fail. But anyway, so it's almost to the end of our segment and now it is to my favorite question. So if you can go back to in time and you can date only one person, who will that be and why? Or meet any person? You see, that was my frozen face. I do that really well. This is where you think there's an internet glitch and I don't have time. <laughs> um, there will be, there will be, there's such a long host. There's those people I would meet to reverse terrible things that have happened in the world. There are those people that I would want to meet because they have been the most inspirational in creating something that if there was a chance to just understand their way of thinking of what they have created in society, there would be those that I would want to meet to tell them if you're doing what you're about to do, because I read it in a history book, here's what's going to happen thereafter. It would, it, it would be too difficult for me to say. Um, and I have to be honest with you, I am, I'm already overwhelmed with the people that I'm meeting at the moment. So I don't have to <laughs> go back anywhere. <laughs> Who would it be for you, Sanjay? Tell me. For me, I will go and uh, spend a day with Rembrandt. I just want to watch him paint. Nothing. Yeah. I don't want to even talk to him. I just want to sit in a corner stool and just watch him paint and say <laughs> how the hell he picked the brush and put the key strokes, the strokes on the mirror. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's all. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people just like you. I can go and meet. Uh, but the reality is by changing the past, nothing will happen. So I want to be the change maker for the future. 
I want to change the future, the better future, I believe, uh, for the society. And they deserve, my kids deserve, and the next generation deserve. So if you ask me, I have a deep respect for our art. No, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, I think one thing, and that might be a different conversation altogether. I ask myself sometimes, to which extent are we allowed to influence the future with the legacy knowledge that we have and bring? Because there's also one danger, which is to implement our history and our current way of thinking and hard coding something for the generations to come. So if you for one second would think that your great grandparents would have hard coded with their beliefs, methodologies, culture, upbringing, and everything that goes with it, and you would now have to live in that world. So I think we need to always be, be aware that with what we can do, and I believe in this quite a lot, is bringing the tools and creating an environment, stopping those things which we inherently know are not good, mm -hmm. bring the younger generation as early as possible into, through education and awareness, um, which in fact is the job of every good parent, um, and, and let them be part of this and then shape the future, but at least let us not fuck up this whilst we are in the middle. And that's the fear I have. In spite of all the learnings we have of thousands of years and uh, education we all got, and that's the reason I'm here. I mean, I give uh, the sole credit where I am in my life is because of the education. I agree. Uh, otherwise, you know, a kid next door who is still starving and is struggling, no different. When we talk about, I'm sure if they check my brain and his brain and all, it'll be pretty similar. I got great education. My parents was really after me. And that's why I'm here. And uh, that's why you are here. You have uh, really focused and you really worked hard, but really education plays a major role. A lot of people doesn't even have access. So, yes. but... Uh, you know, you and me can talk for like hours, hope to see you in person one of these days and we can sit down over a glass of wine and talk. Uh, Puneet has some questions for you, so I will uh, give it to Puneet. Raman, it has been a great, great conversation so far and lots of nuggets of wisdom for our audience. Um, but there, is there any, any lesson or challenges for our audience that you might you want to post here? I want to post... Um... Look, I think, I think the things that, that, that I would say is, um, you know, the, the different messages for different people. I think the message to the entrepreneurs is don't give up, um, feel strong, be encouraged, surround yourself with people who have good energy, um, who want to help who don't always want to challenge this whole idea about let me challenge you, why? Help me, help me, don't challenge. If you know the answer, just help me. There's no point in just pushing back continuously. Sometimes you need that helping hand. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's, I don't, there's another one that I think is important. I think about these things quite a bit. I think, you know, fail fast, total rubbish. It's not about failing, it's about you know, uh, learning out of things. And I think if you, if you change your viewpoint a little bit and you think about it as in not reaching the desired outcome, that makes you feel a lot better than failure. Failure is not a great you know, thing to feel. And it's unnecessary because as long as you, you embrace it and you take it with you, then you, you, the next version of yours will be more informed. It's like riding a bicycle. Um, I think to, to investors, you know, don't waste entrepreneurs' time, don't string them along, be honest. Um, uh, it is really important. Uh, don't set the wrong expectations. I think to uh, uh, large organizations is, you know, wake up and realize how much value you have to add to the innovative community um, in comparison to those 
who can just write a check. It's not all about the money. But when you do make partnerships and investments, then mean it. Don't do it as lip service. Um, mean it. I think to everyone um, is, I, I, I read this the other day and I have to tell you, I took a step back, I slept over it and I'm already making changes myself. And I was, it was a saying which said, everybody is thinking about changing the world, but nobody is thinking about changing themselves. And I think so often we're so caught up in what's going on out here. And I think taking that step back and ever so often thinking, you know, is that necessary? Is this necessary? It's a really, really good thing. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's, it's the normal philosophy of life. Respect others as you would like to be respected yourself. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And if you take those simple, simple, simple things um, to your heart, um, then you will be a great mentor. Um, and it's, it's the first no's are really difficult to say to people because you don't want to upset someone. But actually an honest no is sometimes so much often better because you're not letting someone else astray and you're not wasting that time. And particularly when money is short and you need to rely on things, then from an entrepreneurial perspective, you know, that is, you need to know what you can count on. Um, I think those are a few. And... Um, Spend less time on your own technology. Don't look for the mistake in your kids and working out what should bear their screen time, but actually look at what should be your screen time when you are with your family it would be another one. And I am preaching, um, but I'm myself not very good at it. At the end of the day, what is the most important thing, I think, is our society that we live in and the impact that we drive and is our own family. There's no good in creating all the great things in the world. If your own family isn't happy with who you are and how much you are there for them. So I think, you know, sometimes it is that step back um, and being there for them as much as you need them. For you. No, I completely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the answer. And, it, it, and it, if, you, if somebody just takes quotes from, um, from uh, great men from the past and just try to imbibe that and make that life mission. These things are so simple that you talk about. And uh, in a fast paced life, sometimes we don't think, think about those things like treat people like you want to be treated, be the change that you want to see in the world. Things like that are, are really, really strong. They strong are, lines. you know what? They sound silly when you're young. And the things that my parents said to me, I go, oh my God, and as old as you get, maybe it's sign of age, you know, I, there's a lot of things that I said to myself, I will never say this to my children. And I find myself saying that, but, but there are things that as you grow old, where all of a sudden that makes so much sense. And it is the simplicity in them, you know? Um, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Sure. That's, that's true. Is it, is it the times when you slow down and think more and you don't have your hormones rushing inside? You're asking me personally? Uh, no, I'm just saying for anybody, it's just as you grow. Well, that's I from the next talk. Out, probably think more. <laughs> I don't know, Poonet. I got ADHD. My brain is racing. I can't stop it. So I'm, that's not one of the luxuries that I have. But I think it is, I don't know. I think it is various experiences um, throughout life that make you bounce back. And, you know, you recall out of your deep memory, uh, uh, remote storage, not near line, things that you have heard, which all of a sudden make sense and resonate. I, um, I think that's probably what it is. And, um, and I think it's important, but it is, the reality is, you know, we can, and it's, it's true for so many things. If you want to talk about diversity, you can be in a corporate company and talk diversity all day and night. It is the question is how do you behave at home? What do you teach your kids? Because that's where it starts. It's not when you put on the pin as of, you know, your organization and you have to sing the hymn sheet, um, which for me always is the point about, you know, is it doing the right thing or is it to do things right? 
and one of them is very sustainable and consistent. It's not always comfortable, but it's the right way. Raheem, I can't, uh, you know, we can sit here and talk to you for hours and you have done so much phenomenal work. So I want to thank you very much for your time today. Uh, I love Isn't to stay in touch. Yeah. And whenever you are in the uh, United States, please let me know, uh, either in San Francisco, Vegas, or New York, wherever you are. Uh, really, really great. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure our audience have uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, so on the behalf of IID 2020 team, I want to thank you for supporting our cause and our community. Uh, this is Sanjeev Goyal, conference chair of IIT2020.org, Pan IIT USA's mega virtual event. Please join us, co-invent, and co-define paradigms of future. Dr. Raheem has given us some amazing examples and ideas around it. Uh, people will be there, but uh, this is a dialogue. This is ongoing dialogue, so join us. Uh, please register at iit2020.org. This event is open to all, and we are looking forward to see everyone.